I do see that this is a time where males need guidance and like mm. where there isn't the kind of elders are elders, customs, initiations, roots to masculinity are in short supply. I can see that there's a, a real value in that. Mm -hmm. But I also feel that it, in this time of social contention, identity politics being part of it, co and conflict, that ideas that promote unity mm -hmm. and the immolation of those kind of boundaries, I, it feels to me would be particularly and especially valuable. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, again, but I think the right way to do that is to concentrate on the individual. And so, so let me answer that in two ways. The first thing, the first issue is that it isn't self-evident that the reason that my, what I've been talking about has been attractive to young men, that might be uh, uh, like a fluke. <laughs> and it might be a fluke because almost everybody who watches YouTube is male. Yeah. So like, if I look at my YouTube audience, it's 80% male. But that's true of YouTube audiences in general. So it's just a so, typical YouTube well, audience. Well, right, right. And so what's happening... Is that your intuition? Well, because I, no, feel I that think there, it's there more is something about I think it's more complicated than that. But I do know that since my book has come out, I've, I've been watching the, the demographics of my, of my public audience, that more and more and more women are coming out. So it's now to about 65, 35 from 80, 20. And more and more older people are coming out too. So I think a fair bit of it was a consequence of the fact that most of my exposure and was to the YouTube audience, which happens to be mostly men. Now, I do also think that there is a particular crisis with regards to what might be described as proper pathways to masculinity. I also think that's at play. So I think there's two factors. But I also, I don't think, and Kathy Newman kind of went after me about this, you know, she said, well, you know, if you're directing your message towards young men, which I wasn't, but assuming that's the case, isn't that divisive? And I would say, well, I don't think it is divisive because first of all, the masculine in women also needs to be developed. It's very, very important. And the people who are the enemies of the masculine in men are also the enemies of the masculine in women. So if you overprotect your sons, let's say, you don't want to, you don't want to, you want to, uh, you, you overprotect them in part and, and, and weaken them because you're afraid of their masculine energy. You're going to do exactly the same thing I to agree. your daughters. So that that so 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 that that the, that female a female child would similarly be disempowered. Oh, definitely, because you know the thing is, and this is another thing, is that I am a psychometrician. That's technically my my job, and we study Metrics. the the yeah, measurement. Well, mm. and like it's a truism of psychometrics that men and women are more the same than they are different. You know, it's mm. funny because I've been sort of positioned as someone who is constantly on about the differences between men and women. But men and women are more the same than they are different. And what that means is that the development of masculinity in women, perhaps it's not as important as the development of masculinity in men, but it's damn important. It's like it's a close second. Hmm. And so if people are pushing down masculinity as a virtuous mode of being, then it, it has a detrimental effect on both on sexes. everybody. I agree with this. Uh, but, uh, but you would say that determinately that, and biologically that there is a thing that is masculinity and that thing, masculinity, is present in both females oh, de and males. De definitely. Um, but I, I think, again, one of, the, uh, one of the challenges that this argument or the, the, appears to be built around is a sort of hierarchy around those traits masculinity being synonymous for example with power oh here's the mm -hmm. thing i wanted to bloody ask you mm -hmm. check this out because it was a bit i said it on a youtube video on my own the other day and i thought i wonder if this stands up to scrutiny i goes um i feel the use of the female in advertising and commodification in general is the is the perverted desire to worship the feminine, mm -hmm. the negated and neglected feminine has found its expression through consumerism and commerce because it is not being properly honoured socially. What do you reckon? I, 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 I made I, it up. I would have to think that, I'd have to think about that a long time. Up. I would have to think about that a long time. It's a good idea though, isn't it? it? It's, it's an idea worth we're thinking about for a while. Like if there are essential, if we have essential yearnings, mm -hmm. if we have like, you know, like e.g. If, if the, you know, like the, in, sort of, 
if in indigenous cultures we would have deities to represent gender or certain energies that are subtler than gender, if there is yeah. a sense that socially those energies are not being expressed or honored, as you have implied with yeah, male oh, pathways. That's, right. that's definitely the case. So one of the things that I've often thought about ideologies is that they're they're like parasites on religious structures. And if you're thinking that the the movement of feminine imagery up into the consumerist world is an analog or is, is at least in partial par part a consequence of not having a symbolic place where that attraction can be expressed. I think that's probably right. It's like it's like in the United States is the the first family tends to be turned into king and queen. Yeah. Because there's no place for that symbolic projection. Yeah, the template requires it. Yeah. And I heard once an analysis of the uh, Soviet Union uh, after the revolution that it mimicked the mo monarchic mm -hmm. tyranny that preceded it just in a, a different format. Right, And it right. seemed, yeah, that, that, that sort of certain well, they energies... they had their holy trinity even, right? Yes. Mao, Marx, Lenin. Amazing. Or Mao, Marx, Stalin, depending on the Trinity. But and and some would argue that we you know sort of like that Christianity couldn't take hold in Latin America until they embraced the pantheonism of the saints and found and the figure of uh, the Virgin until they like they you know that in certain cultures the the Virgin had to be elevated because there mm. isn't a place in the Father, Son, Holy Ghost for the divine mm -hmm. feminine. Yeah, well, that's a Jungian idea. Definitely. Yeah, oh, is it? That, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. That that's that's an original idea of Jung's. Is that cool? The, the, the Trinity is missing a quartile, and sometimes that quartile is filled by the figure of the devil, and sometimes it's filled by the figure of the woman. So it's like it's like the houses in, in Harry Potter, right? There's three good houses in Slytherin. Is in the, uh, in the, yeah, and it's in the bottom quadrant. It's a it's a reflection of the same kind of Mandela structure. That's pretty cool. So it's you, very cool. You yes. have to. It's very cool. Have a place at the table for the serpent. You have mm -hmm. to have a place. Hmm. Mm -hmm. what that's about, what happens in Sleeping Beauty, right? In the Disney movie, they, they don't let in that. They don't crone. Let, they, that's right. They they don't invite her to the christening, and so their daughter ends up unconscious. Mm. Right. They don't let the terrible mother come to the party, so How, the daughter ends up unconscious. In our domestic, normal, everyday, quotidian lives, what is the terrible mother? How does that over help us? Overprotection. Overprotection. Don't overprotect the baby. Let no. it fall over a little yeah, bit. Yeah, that's right. You do do the least amount possible for your children. It's something like that. That's not neglect. It's nothing like that. It's like the old age home adage, you know. Look, I've seen this lots of times with parents. It's like maybe you have to get your kid dressed up to go out. Well, it takes a long time if you let your kid do it, you know. Mm. It's a lot faster just to do it. It's a lot faster not to have them set the table. It's a lot faster to do things for them. Plus, there's, there's also, and, and this is part of the devouring mother archetype, is like if you've devoted your life to a child, perhaps more than you should have, let's say, then it's very difficult to let the child go. Because yes. like, what, what's there left for you? And so there's this terrible temptation to play, well, I'll do everything for you but you never leave me. And then for the child to say, yeah, that's right. That's exactly the right face to make for that. That's a very terrible thing. And you see that again in Disney's Sleeping Beauty where Maleficent has the heroic prince in the dungeon and is laughing at him. Right? She's not going to let him go until he's ancient. And that's, and that's a consequence. Where else so do we a... see the devouring mother? What are some good pop cultural examples of the oh, devouring mother? Oh, you see it in mother? Disney movies all the time. They've always got one. Um, in, in, the little, in the Little Mermaid, oh. Ursula is oh, yeah, the devouring yeah. mother. The devouring mother shows up all the time. She's the witch. She's the swamp dweller. She's the she's the evil queen in Snow White. What's the counterpoint? The fairy godmother. Yeah, the fairy godmother's one. Yeah, that's the positive feminine, mm. and that that happened. That that archetype manifests itself all over the place as well. The 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 fairy godmother is a good one, and you see in 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 uh, in Sleeping Beauty, there's three of them, the three little fairies that take care of the princess in the forest. They're they're the archetype of the positive feminine. 